Yes, I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and my guest today is T.R. Reed, a media correspondent and author of The Healing of America, A Global Quest for Better, Cheaper, and Fairer Healthcare, which he wrote trailing around the world to compare national healthcare systems. Welcome, T.R. Shirley, great to be here. You know, when you traveled around the world, you saw that most other countries actually guarantee health care for their citizens, and the U.S. does not. Yeah, what a striking difference. All the other industrialized democracies, I mean, you know, countries like us, rich, free market, industrialized, advanced democracies, they all provide health care for everybody. It's high quality care, and guess what? They spend half as much as we do. So that's what I did. I went around the world to see if I could figure out how they do it. Now, they're doing it probably by keeping salaries for doctors and hospitals in a different kind of ratio, aren't they? Yeah, that's absolutely true. American doctors make much more than doctors anywhere else. American hospitals are the highest priced hospitals in the world. And this all goes together. You know, I said they cover everybody and they spend less. It's not a coincidence. If you have everybody in the system, it turns out that's a cheaper way to run health care than this kind of erratic coverage that we have. You know, in America, some people get the finest care in the world. That's why Arab sheiks fly to Mayo, Mayo Clinic. But a lot of people are kind of left out the door. That doesn't happen in other countries. The other countries have a basic floor of care that everybody gets. And if you arrange things that way, it just saves a lot of money. So this is really a moral question, though, because uh, for the people who are getting health care in the United States, uh, most of people think that there's no problem. I'm getting good care. Why would I want a, a uh, slightly lower a convenience or standard of care in order for everyone to have it, because it doesn't affect me. And, and you are really making an argument that this is a moral question. You first have to say, should everyone have health care? Yeah, you absolutely got my book. Well, the main thing I learned going around the world was when you design a country's health care system, look, it involves medical decisions, it involves economic decisions, obviously a political question. Primarily, though, it's a moral question. Do you want to be a society where everybody who's sick can have access to a doctor. And if you decide to be that society, hey, you can do it. There's a mechanism, and all the other countries have done it. And one of the mysteries for me in the book, I figured out how the other countries do it, right. I think. I figured out why the other countries do it, but I still can't figure out why the world's richest country doesn't provide coverage for everybody. Well, more. let's explore that some, because yeah. uh, we consider ourselves a moral country. We consider ourselves uh, almost a faith-based country. We've yes. heard that in the rhetoric of our yeah, politicians. Sure. Yeah. So why haven't we been asking this moral question as the first question instead of how much is this going to cost? That seems to be the primary question in the United States all the time. Yeah, and who's going to win and who's going to lose and insurance company reimbursement rates and all that stuff. Uh, I argue in my book, every time we get to this issue, we lose the basic moral question amid all the mechanics of insurance company payments and hospital payments and the like. Why is it? Uh, you know, I can't figure it out. So here, I'll tell you my theories. Okay. One theory is, hey, we're a democratic country. We designed the system. We want the system we've got where a lot of people get great care and tens of millions don't get it. Uh, is that right? Are we that kind of country? I think no. Okay. So I finally conclude Americans don't know how cruel our system is. I mean, do you know this? About 22,000 Americans die every year of treatable diseases because they can't afford a doctor. These are not poor people. Okay. Uh, poor people have Medicaid. They're okay. These are right. middle class people who got sick, lost their job, they can't get insurance. They're too rich for Medicaid and they're too poor to pay for a doctor and um, they die. And right. no other rich country lets that happen. Now, do we want to be that society, or would we like to be like Germany or France or Japan, where everybody gets treatment? Okay, so what do you lose under the system where everybody gets treatment? I, I'm, I heard you say that, with some people <laughs> will have to get less. Uh, yeah. That just depends on how you organize the system. In some countries, Canada is a great, great example, you have to wait forever. For, you know, if you're sick, they treat you, but if all you have is a bum knee or a bad hip or something, then you wait. So you have to trade some convenience. You don't have to, no. As a matter of fact, many countries, Germany, France, Japan, Netherlands, have shorter waiting times than America for elective surgery, for an appointment to see a doctor, shorter waiting times, and they cover everybody. Um, you don't have to give up a choice of insurance plans. In Germany, they have 220 insurance companies, private insurance companies. You can take, you can buy from any com company in the country, get this, 
If a German doesn't like her health insurance, she can drop it on 60 days notice and the next guy can't raise her rates. Now that's more choice than any American has. No American has a choice like that. So yeah, in some countries they limit choice and they keep you waiting, but many countries do not. So I don't know what you have to give up. There's a tax issue because yeah. it does get paid for by yeah. someone oh, yeah, and, yeah. and it comes out of people's taxes, doesn't yeah. it? And, and most of Germany... You mean in the other countries? In the other companies. Well, they're different models. In some countries, uh, health care is, you know, what we call socialized medicine. Right. I'm not sure Americans know what socialized medicine means. We know it's bad. <laughs> we don't we like don't know it. What it uh, I would say socialized medicine is what I saw, for example, in Britain and Spain and Italy and Scandinavia. In those countries, Government owns the hospitals, government employs the doctors, government buys the pills, and you don't get a bill. That's socialized medicine. Okay, so everything is sort of seamless, but Yeah, no the government bills, takes yeah. care of it. But there are a lot of countries, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, Netherlands, Japan, where they cover everybody with private docs, private hospitals, and private insurance. Get and what this. if I'm unemployed? What if I'm unemployed and I live in Germany or Japan? Then the government Japan? takes the role of your employer and pays that part of the premium. If you have no money, the government pays the whole premium. Okay. Um, if you lose your job, for example, in Switzerland or France, uh, you keep the same insurance. You don't lose your insurance. You still keep paying your part of the premium if you can afford it, and government pays the employer's part of the premium. In most of Europe, that's about 75%. Well, what if I'm making about $19,000, maybe $25,000, but I've got to pay my mortgage, and I've got to pay my car payment, I've got to buy my necessities, and I don't have any money for that premium. What happens in those countries, Germany, Japan? Uh, is it so reasonable that I would still pay it, or... Do, can I opt not to pay it? Well, in many countries, in Germany, Netherlands, France, Japan, your, your health insurance premium is a percentage of your pay, just like Social Security tax here. So if you're making $19,000, you are paying 7% of $19,000. It's not very much. Um, so it's an automatic deduction. Yeah, it, you right. have to have insurance. That's okay. a given in all these countries. But the important thing is, in many, in all in these countries I'm describing to you, these are private insurance plans. Get this, Germany doesn't have Medicare. They don't? No, people stay with the private insurer cradle to grave. To me, that's less socialized in the United States. Um, do you think it has to do with the fact that there uh, are fewer people in those countries when you compare population, you know, uh, United States has 300 million yeah. people, you know, Germany about 81 million, uh, yeah. Japan about 127 million, and then they're smaller, 65 million, Canada only 33 million people. Yeah. Does that make a difference? I don't think so. No. So the efficiencies of scale or anything like that or the fact that we're so large just makes it impossible? No, um, Switzerland has a model that's 8 million people. Japan has almost the identical model. It's 130 million people, as you said. No, I don't think that's the difference. No, those systems work. So here's what I told you, Shirley. Some countries I have socialized medicine where government does it all. Some countries are private, private docs and private insurance. And then there's a third model, which is kind of the middle ground, where the providers, the docs and hospitals, the labs are private. But the payment scheme is government, and Canada is a classic case of that. Uh, you, everybody in Canada has to pay this tax. They call it a premium, but it's a right. tax. Right. Um, and you go to the doctor for free. But the doctor's a private a business. The hospitals are largely private. So, um, so that's there is kind that of a blended model. Uh, yeah, there's competition in Canada. You can go to any doctor in the entire country, and insurance has to pay. They don't have in-network None of that stuff. They don't have pre-authorization. You just go to the doctor. The problem with Canada is you have to wait. But a lot of countries that use their model, the private payment, private provider and public payment, let's see, Korea uses that, Venezuela uses that, um, Taiwan, they have shorter waiting times than America. So it can work. The amount that people got uh, reimbursed for, the doctors or the hospitals, yeah. that is set at a fairly low level in the countries that you reviewed. How does that impact the hospital quality and the physician salary? Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, all everywhere I went, the doctors make less than the United States. And every doctor I talked to around the world, have you ever met a doctor who makes enough? <laughs> I didn't meet a single doctor around the world who was paid enough. You know, <laughs> that, that, it's just like farmers. Have you noticed that? No <laughs> farmer ever makes enough for his work. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, they make less and the hospitals are paid less. They, they make less. They're not big for-profit corporations like they are in the United States. Do you think our insurance companies are going to push back if we try to make them nonprofit? 
Well, th that's a good question. Where does profit come into health care? Uh, most of the countries I went to have decided that the providers, the doctors, hospitals, drug companies, labs, they can be for profit. They compete against each other. That's fine. But all the other countries have decided that the payment scheme, health insurance, should be nonprofit. They think there's a direct conflict between paying for people's health care and paying a profit to investors. If you need to pay investors a dividend, then you turn people down. Then right, you so deny who are you claims. working for, really? Yeah, exactly. Well, they're working for their investors, their corporations. Um, and yes, of course, they will resist controls on their administrative costs and their profits. But we saw that, I saw that in many other countries, and they've just said, look, you want to be in the business of providing people's health care. Your administrative costs have to be limited, and you're not going to make a profit at it. That's just a restriction they've made. Um, traditionally, American health insurance, when Blue Cross and Blue Shield started in the 30s, they were always nonprofit until the 1980s. So what happened? Why did they become a profit? Uh, kind of a bunch of big companies like Aetna, this company uh, in Minnesota, WellPoint, started buying up these nonprofit Blue Cross and Blue Shield state by state and turning them into for-profit corporations. And that's when they started denying people coverage. That's when they started denying claims because they realized there was a lot of money to be made if you did this. Some of the, the hospitals we have in the United States are exceptional. They're, they've got new equipment. You've got incredible hospital beds. You've got uh, everything yeah. really at your disposal. And this, has, this comes at a price, obviously. And you've pointed out in your book that it's very expensive to run those kinds of hospitals. And yet the kinds of hospitals you described in your book seemed meager. Yeah, they don't, uh, a lot of these countries, see Britain, Japan, France, they don't invest in physical plant. Right. You go to a doctor's office in France, it is just plain you Jane. I mean, it that. is just a plain white building. There's no National Geographic on the table because there's no table. There's just a bench along the wall. Uh, very plain, but the care is great. In fact, there are comparative studies. This Commonwealth Fund in New York does compare, they do call it national report cards. It's sad to say, but on most measures, the other Europe, the European countries and Japan do better than the United States at curing predictable diseases, keeping newborn infants alive. They, Japan has one yeah. third the infant mortality that we do. Right. The big difference is they don't have these huge offices of people doing the billing. Oh yes, right. You know, I went to a 900 bed hospital in Canada, and that that's a big hospital by American standards. Right. You know? Yes. And the guy's taking me around. Here's our new birthing facility. Look at this beautiful new. You know, he's very proud of it. And I said to him, Well, where's the billing office? Yeah. And this president of this hospital is all embarrassed. It turns out, in a 900 bed hospital in Canada, the billing office is two part timers. They come in the last two days of the month, and one of them, her full-time job is billing American tourists who came up and broke their leg or something. You know. uh, but an American hospital with 900 beds would have 200 people working full-time right. on billing. In Britain, yeah. you say that the primary care folks, the pediatricians, the family medicine folk, yes. they're actually paid more, and there are more of them. Yeah, in America, specialists. only about 35% of doctors are primary care doctors. And Countries want more primary care docs because they can do a lot of the stuff that specialists do and it's cheaper and faster. In Britain, my family doctor down the street yeah. made twice as much as a cardiac surgeon. Right. You know, he's paid well, so guess what? 64% of the docs in Britain are primary care. If you pay them, they'll come. Well, there is an incentivization uh, aspect to this whole debate. And when you start paying doctors less, you are going to perhaps disincentivize some individuals from going into medicine. Do we want that? Yeah, I'm not sure I buy that premise. I hear the argument. Right. Uh, I know a lot of docs. Most people that I know who are doctors got into it. They were good in biology in high school. They like science, and they want to use the skills they've got to help people. Well, now, you know, if you can make 600000 a year in the process, that's fine, but that's not why they're there. There are orthopedic surgeons in America who really help people. They really fix broken limbs, making a million dollars a year. I don't have any problem cutting that guy to 450000 a year and put the money into primary care. You talk about efficiencies, too, in your book, and that was such a winning argument because the inefficiencies that we have from all of this paying and billing and so on, that has got to be able to save this system a lot of money, which we could use then to cover individuals who do not have health care. 
And they did it with, a, especially interesting was this uh, this card in yeah, France. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, does, is there any downside to that? Does it really work and could it work in a s system our size? Well, it could, I don't think, I think it's irrelevant in size. In, in France, they had, this is the carte vitale. 61 million people, 61 million cards. Everybody's got one. It's just like the driver's license in your wallet. And it has your whole medical record on a little gold chip in the middle. So, and I asked them, God, this is a privacy problem. Somebody's going to chip into my health They're record. Right, download you know? it somewhere. They, the French health ministry told me this has never happened. It's encrypted. Oh, it's easy, safe, you know. And <laughs> uh, Germany now has it too. In Germany, it's called the Gesundheit Karte. Oh, I like that. Yeah, don't you like that? The health <laughs> card. Taiwan has it. A lot of countries have it. So why don't we have this? We don't have it because each of our big insurance system plans, companies, has devised its own proprietary billing system. They've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on them, and they don't want to give them up. And so when Congress proposes that everybody in America get a card like this, which would save us hundreds of millions of dollars a year, uh, the kind of infrastructure fights back because they want their own system. Well, it, it's, it's, they fight back because they know that there will be job losses or job change or costs. Things and some, will be more efficient, yeah. And yeah. for some people, that's a bad thing. But right. more efficient health care would be good for our country. It would be good for our country. Now, when you have those cards, though, if I found it on the street, yeah. uh, you, you're supposed to mail it back in, and it gets back to Drop its owner. Drop in any mailbox. That's what it says on the back of the right. French card. But if I took that, would I be able to, if I had the right equipment, download somebody's medical care? Could you Could you do that? Well, I, that's a really good question. Could they figure out, you know, whether I'm taking Viagra or not? Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah right. Know? You know, so your uh, privacy would be uh, yeah, impacted. Uh, and as I say, I asked that in Austria and Germany and France, and they say we haven't, you know, we have good encryption. Hey, there's some pretty smart people out there with home computers. It's a worry. I think it's a serious worry. But on the other hand, today, if you go to any hospital in America, patients are coming That's out right. with their records in a folder. That's easier to steal. You know. Yeah. Now, when we think about changing some of the practices, do we have to, in America, change our structures as well as our practices? Can you just piecemeal this thing or how much of an overhaul we're going to have to look at? I don't think that we can get where we want to get through marginal change of our existing system. We have the most inefficient, the most expensive, and the most unfair system of any rich country. So just kind of tinkering with that system, I don't think will work. One reason is we don't have a health care system. We have 19 health care systems. There's okay. one for veterans. Right. There's one different one for active duty medical personnel. There's one for members of Congress. Uh, there's one for working people with good insurance. There's one for, you know, self-insured people who can buy insurance. There's one for poor people. We have all these overlapping systems. In all the other countries, everybody's in one. They've put everybody in one system. And here's what you get out of that. A, you have one set of rules, one set of forms. In many countries, one set of prices. Right. Uh, vastly simpler. And that saves hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, second, it gives you a really good incentive for preventive health. If everybody's in the same system, the system can save some money by keeping you healthy. Whereas an American insurance company, their average customer is with them for 4.8 years. If they, they spend change? money yeah. to keep you healthy, right. it's a waste because you're going to, when you get sick, you're going to be on Medicare. You know. Uh, and third, the other countries have everybody in the same system because they think it's fairer. Yeah. They think health care should be allocated, like voting, for example, where everybody gets the same. We've never made that decision, and that's one of the reasons we have this crazy, quilt, expensive system. So to get to that point where there's one system that everybody's in and it operates efficiently, that would be major change in America. Well, there's something that goes against the grain of the American individualism with yeah. that, right? Yeah. This idea that in Canada, well, as long as the rich Canadian has to wait, as long as the poor Canadian yes, has to wait. Yes, they're into that, yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think in America, it's sort of like, look, if I've earned it, if I've got my own wealth, I want to be able to get to the head of the line. I want to be able to buy what I want. So would that kind of have to change with that mentality of, you know, look, I've done it, I get it? Uh, well, there are a lot of commodities where we say if you've worked hard and have right. the money or inherited the money, you get it. Right. The question is whether health care is that kind of commodity. And the economist term for this is the distributional ethic. What's your ethic for distributing goods? Well, we have a distributional ethic for votes. Okay. Everybody gets one. Right. Bill Gates gets yes, one. Right. His chauffeur gets one. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have a different distributional ethic for yachts. 
That's true. If you have money, you can have 10 of them. If you don't have money, tough. Right. And we don't mind that. Right. So here's the question. Do you think health care is more like voting or is it more like yachting? Well, what I found in my book is all the other countries have said, no, this is, this is like voting. This is like education. This is like equal treatment. Everybody should have the same, but the U.S. hasn't made that commitment. Well, there is, we come right back to that moral question. Exactly. Which is, do you take care of your brother and sister because yeah. it's the right thing to do? Yeah. Or do you just walk on the other side and say, oh, too bad for you. You must not have done something right. Or you didn't work hard you enough. You didn't work you hard enough, and you can't do that. Yeah. That's right. Or if yeah. you would just be a better person, you could have health care, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's just wrong, isn't it? Well, the other countries have all said that. The other countries right. have said this is something everybody should get. There's a doctor in France in my book, Valérie Numont, and she said to me, oh, you Americans, you say all are created equal, but this is ridiculous. She said, <laughs> she said some are beautiful and some are not, and yeah. some are brilliant and some are not. But then she said, but once you get sick, everybody is equal because we can do something about it. And that is the ethic in France. Once you get sick, they're going to treat you the same way as the president of France. Right. Same doctor, same price, same waiting time. That's not true in the United States. I think everybody in America would say, you know, Rush Limbaugh got sick. He, he said, I want to get treated in America. It's the best. He's right. For Rush Limbaugh, it's the best care in the world. There's no question. But I don't think we would expect Rush Limbaugh's gardener or his plumber to have as good care as he does. That's standard in America. In other countries, it would be considered immoral if the gardener had less good health care. Right, or if they would go bankrupt or if they would have a lifelong change of circumstance because of an illness. Yeah, exactly. That wouldn't be, that's not acceptable in other countries. And I'm not even sure it's acceptable in the United States. If you poll on the question, do you think that everyone in your community who gets sick should have access to a doctor? 96% of Americans say yes to that. That's right. Um, they think we should do it. But we've never done it. And I, as you saw, I really struggle in my book with the question of why don't we do it? Right. Because we could do it. The other right. countries have done it. Well, the, I think that you're right. We don't see the person who necessarily goes bankrupt or we don't know the person who has diabetes yeah, or lupus right. yeah. who can't get treatment. Yes. And so that doesn't come home to affect us. And all you have to do is have one family member who is devastatingly affected by a health care problem. They either get denied coverage or... Uh, let's say that they uh, get sick and they lose their job and then can never get insurance again. Yeah. And then you find out what is going to happen to that person. Yeah, and that's happening to tens of millions of our fellow citizens. On the first page of my book, we meet a 32-year-old college graduate who got lupus and died. She couldn't afford to see a doctor. She and died it's the medication. It's, it's like that ongoing care that she couldn't afford. If She, she could go to an emergency room. Yeah, she did at the end, right. but by then it was too late. Was you too have late. to be really sick to get free care in America, unless you're poor. If you're right. poor, then you get We care. do take care of the very poor, and there are some outstanding examples of that. But Absolutely. there's a, a group of people who don't get covered. I think people are, uh, just briefly, uh, concerned about the end-of-life care, that yeah. these systems yeah. are ration care for important uh, things and take those decisions away. Did you see that? Yeah, every country has to make those decisions because no healthcare system, including ours, can afford to do everything. So, for example, in Britain, after a given age, and it kind of varies by region, but about 89 or 90, they won't give you kidney dialysis. Right. And that basically means you're going to die. Right. Uh, but in Britain, there's a pool of money that treats everybody. So if they say to me, well, your grandmom's not going to get dialysis, my grandma's going to die. Right. But at least I know the money is going to go help some sick baby because there's a pool of money. In America, if Aetna or WellPoint says to you, we're not paying for that treatment, the money is not going to help somebody else. It's going to help the investors in WellPoint. Um, it's a little harder to stomach, I think. So, uh, but yeah, it's certainly true. All countries have this problem of, you know, 70% of all the money spent on your health care and your life is spent in the last month. Right. They all have that issue. They're all trying to deal with it. It's difficult. It's politically difficult. It is. It's ethically difficult. So everybody has that problem. The U.S. has it too, though. Right. And right now, we think that we have ultimate choice all the way to the end because we haven't instituted that kind of ethical or moral conversation as well. So it sounds like America is going to be moving into a much deeper ethical conversation around this issue as we move forward. God, I hope so, because it is a moral issue, and we have to make this ethical decision. Do you want your neighbors going bankrupt because they happen to get sick. Which doesn't happen in Europe. 
No, no. You know how many? There, well, there are about 800,000 medical bankruptcies in the United States every year. Right. Um, in Britain, zero. Germany, zero. France, zero. Japan, zero. They don't let that happen. Right. Is there any nonprofit governmental system in the United States today that is as efficient as either Germany, France, or Canada? Yeah, Medicare. Okay. Medicare's administrative costs are in the range of 4%, and the VA is a model, a model of high-tech efficiency. They don't have paper records anymore in the Veterans Administration. I have a little plastic card for the VA. Well, my guest today has been T.R. Reed, media correspondent and author of the Healing of America, a Global Quest for Better, Cheaper, and Fairer Healthcare. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Intercompany.